All right, y'all, before we jump into this week's episode, I have some incredibly exciting news. This week, we printed the very first issue of The Good Newspaper. I woke up at 5 a.m., drove to this random town in the middle of nowhere in Tennessee where there's this giant ancient printing press used for printing newspapers, and I got to experience the wonderful creation of this thing that we've been working on for months, The Good Newspaper. If you're just hearing about The Good Newspaper, The Good Newspaper is a physical quarterly newspaper that celebrates the people and ideas and movements that are changing the world for the better, And we had an incredible community of people rally around this on Kickstarter where we doubled our initial Kickstarter goal and we were able to create this actual newspaper filled with good news for a change. It's really, really fun. And if you already ordered one, it is on its way to you. It's going out. It's shipping as we speak. And if you haven't already ordered one, but you want one, you can order yours at shop.goodgoodgood.co. Goodness gracious, you're going to want to grab this. I'm holding it right now, and this thing is just, I'm opening it up. Oh, my gosh. I'm so happy with the way that it turned out. I'm so excited that this exists. I'm so excited to be able to deliver this to mailboxes soon. So, man, thank you, everyone, for your support. Check it out, shop.goodgoodgood.co, and uh, here we go with the show. This week on the show, we're diving into a story that when I first heard about it, I deeply resonated with it. I felt like it was beautiful and unique and powerful. This week, we're having a conversation with a guy whose job it is to help save people, and he feels like his work is being thwarted. It's a story of how he's fighting to stay optimistic and to make the biggest difference he can, despite so many internal and external conflicts in his way. This is Sounds Good with Brandon Harvey. My name is Brandon Harvey, and every single week we host hopeful conversations with optimists and world changers about the unique experiences that drive them to use their influence for good. And this week on the show, we're talking with a guy named Eric Holthaus, who Rolling Stone referred to as the rebel nerd of meteorology. Yes, that is like the best title ever. Uh, Ultimately, that means that Eric is a meteorologist and a writer, and he's written frequently about the impacts of global climate change. And I know that that phrase, climate change, can kind of cause some red flags for people. This is not a political episode. This is the story of one person who happens to work in the context of the world of climate change and weather, and ultimately how those things impact human beings. And I think that's one thing I love about Eric, is everything comes back to people, no matter what he's doing. Eric has this fantastic belief that weather unites us in unique and incredible ways and that this notion should be celebrated. And he totally relishes in the innovative idea that connecting people to weather can be revolutionary. I really enjoyed this conversation. I really like Eric. This is our first time talking and I'm so glad we got to talk. So without any further ado, let's just jump right into my conversation with Eric Holthaus. So Eric, I found you on Twitter, which is amazing. Like all of my favorite people, I think I met on Twitter. I met my wife on Twitter. Um, oh. <laughs> I'm not saying that you and I are getting married from this conversation, um, but I'm not saying it's impossible. Uh, uh, that's so awkward. I'm sorry. But I came across your story because you are somebody who has a lot of expertise in a particular subject, but you bring so much personality to that subject. And it's a subject that I don't know a whole lot about. But your personality and your passion and your care for it, I resonate with so deeply that I've almost started to become passionate about meteorology and science and all these things because I've been following you and keeping up with your work. And so I'm really excited to be having this conversation with you today. Yeah, well, that is so flattering. Thank you. (laughs) It's like a, a life goal probably for every one of your listeners to have that sort of affirmation. So I'm so thankful that you're able to give that to me right now. Thank you. Oh, man. So you've been working in the world of climate change for 11 years now, doing all kinds of sciencey stuff that I don't know anything about. Tell me about 
you know, what your job looked like in the beginning. How did you get into this world? Was this something you were always passionate about or did you stumble into it? What does that look like? Yeah, I, I honestly, I kind of did stumble into it a little bit. I grew up really obsessed with weather and I think that still, that still shows, um, <laughs> you know, like right now we're, we're having this big heat wave here in Tucson, Arizona. And I, I'm kind of like obsessed with just like going out at random times of the day just to feel what it's like and just say like, okay, this is what it's like when it's 97 degrees at 1.30 a.m. Like, this is weird. <laughs> like, it, it just feels weird, but it also feels like you're experiencing the world in a different way that you never have before. And that's amazing. Like, I don't know that there's anything else that I enjoy more than that, than just sort of feeling what it's like to be alive in the world. And that's what weather is for me. It's just wow. like my way of interacting with the world. Well, it's interesting because weather is something that, connects us on such a deep level as well. You know, everybody experiences weather, weather travels, whether, you know, it went like this week, it was raining and thunderstorms in Nashville, Tennessee, where I live. And then like the next day it was rainy and thunderstorms in Knoxville, Tennessee, where my wife's parents live. It's just cool that like there's that connection point with weather and it can unite us in, in unique ways and that you're passionate about that. Yeah. And so that's sort of how I got into work on climate. And that it was at the time where I think that at least the approach that I was taking, I was working with an organization called Oxfam, as well as Columbia University. We were on a project working with farmers in rural parts of Ethiopia. We're basically trying to say, you know, if you guys are struggling with, with drought here, we need to find a way to provide that safety net to where you don't feel like you're afraid of losing everything every time there's a drought. And that's sort of been the, the cycle for so long there. And, you know, before we had things like crop insurance in the U.S., it was the same thing here. You know, like my grandparents and great grandparents lived through the Dust Bowl in Kansas where I grew up. And you just like I connect with people on that. It's like we shouldn't have to change our life and we shouldn't have to you know, be worried about our future and our kids future just based on what the weather is in any given day. So providing that safety net is what I was working towards. Just sort of like the, the cross section between weather and social justice and human rights and just making sure that everyone had the ability to, you know, feed themselves and their family and have a have a regular life as possible. Man, that's I didn't know that you had the the social justice aspect of what you're doing. I did know that you were so good at connecting weather to people. But okay, so were you working in Ethiopia for a while then? Yeah, for a little bit. It was mostly project based and it wasn't really as as intensive as I would have liked. It was more of like an, an in and out type thing where I would stay for a couple months and then leave. So I never really felt totally grounded there. But it was still a thing where it helped me bring much broader perspective to my work here at home too. Thinking like we are all experiencing the weather, every one of us all around the world. And like you said, it's all connected too. It's like we have a physical link to each other through the weather. And I think that's just amazing. So what is the work that you're doing at home? I am working on a book right now. And I'm also just working on regular journalism, writing articles and that sort of thing. Specifically focusing on if there's a big storm, I'll, I'll write about the storm and with some some context. Um there was this really sad and tragic fire in Portugal this weekend, a, a wildfire. And I just want to like write a little bit about, you know, like how that people's care for, for the environment and for forests affects the risk of, the, of those sorts of things happening. So what are ways that we can reduce the chances of those sorts of things happening just by taking better care of the forest? And, you know, sadly, you have to use these sorts of wake up calls as sort of like a, a way to get people to pay attention. I wish that it was the other way around, that people would want to pay attention to things that help, you know, improve themselves and the world around them at all t points of time and like perfectly interested in everything that everyone needs to be interested in at all the time. But it just doesn't work that way. Man, so you've been doing this kind of work for more than a decade now. But I feel like things are more partisan than ever with the world of, of weather and climate. And it, it feels so crazy that it has become so partisan. But what has that 
process kind of been like for you on a personal level? You know, starting a decade ago, working through all of this, you know, trying to make a difference in the world, trying to make an impact in people's day to day lives through your work and kind of seeing some people dismissing your work. You know, what, what does that feel like? I can't even imagine. Yeah. I mean, it's really sort of you have to go back to the roots of why you started in the first place. And I think that if you have knowledge that you find through science, through the scientific method, and it's provable, you know, this is something that is we know we're very, very confident that certain actions result in changes to the atmosphere. I mean, it's just that's just how that we've learned that the atmosphere works, just like that's how we learn that, you know, electricity works by sending electrons through wires to to your house from the power plant, like that sort of thing. We just know that that's just how it works. And going back to that, those roots really helps ground me. And I don't really end up paying attention to a lot of the sort of political debates when that happens. Just focus on your, the work and know that that this is something that we can sort of prove that we're going to be making the world a better place by addressing these things because we know the results of our actions and we know the results of changing our actions. So it's just a matter of trying to talk about it in a way that gets people excited about what the potential is rather than being focused on the negative aspects of it. Or, you know, I don't like talking about like pipelines or climate deniers or any of that kind of stuff because I don't think I think it distracts from what where the real work needs to be which is with each other and with people and with trying to just make it happen <laughs> I, I just feel like I'm a, a lot more practical person that doesn't really end up getting into that sort of stuff very much yeah and I mean I can see that in your writing I can see that that you're you're really pay attention to the practical side of things you, you know you're you're not in the world of politics. You didn't get in this to be in the world of politics. You got into this because you're passionate about science and you're passionate about people and you're able to bring those things together. When I first found out about you, I actually saw this Twitter moment. It was this long Twitter thread that you shared of a series of tweets about mental health and self-care and what that looks like for you in your day-to-day working as working in the world that you work in. You talked about how you know, on the day that I saw those tweets, you had gone to see a counselor for the first time, which I started going to counseling actually right around the same time. I might have even tweeted you on that day. And I would love to hear you share a little bit more about the process of deciding to dive into self-care in in the work that you do. Yeah, I mean, it, it got to be sort of inescapable for me, just wondering, like, what what am I doing? Like, is this really useful and sort of doubt, doubting myself that the world had sort of come so far and so many people seemed to be not paying attention to what to me was clearly this global scale issue that required immediate and urgent addressing. You know, we it's sort of when you push a boulder off of a mountain slope, like there's not a whole lot of time for arguing about whether or not it's going to crush you, you know, if it's heading straight for you. We need to start working together on a way to stop it rather than just like arguing about is it coming at me or not. So, and that's the pressure that I feel every day when I'm writing about weather and climate is like this thing is coming at us and we have to just start focusing on the work itself rather than wondering whether, wondering what's going to happen. You know, we know what's going to happen it's not going to be good. And we still have an opportunity to change that. It's just like my internal optimism was just not meshing with the world around me. Everyone else seemed to be not caring at all. If anything, just totally rejecting the the problem that it even existed uh, or that even exists. So, and that's from both sides, from both, you know, environmentally minded people and people that don't don't think about the environment very much. Like, both sides were just t- tuning it out to say like either it's not an issue at all or we're completely screwed and we're all going to die anyway. So there's not any sense in working about it. So and it, it gets to you after a while, like what, like what, what can I, what can I do to make sure that I have enough energy to keep going and addressing this? And yeah. And that's like an emotional energy at that point, you know, it, it's hard to carry that on. And, and you peg me as somebody who is defiantly optimistic 
And that's, I think, why I was drawn to you. And, and that's why I've loved reading your work. And it is tricky because you're you're stuck between two sides. You're stuck between a side who maybe says, hey, your your job doesn't matter because it's not real. And another side who maybe says, hey, everything is terrible. And so there's no use in, in doing what you're doing. And you're in this middle part where you're saying, we can still make a difference. We can still make an impact. So you like you kind of hit this almost emotional wall and you decided, hey, I need to start taking care of myself. I know this is personal, so feel free to to opt out. But what did that kind of process look like when you decided to start going to counseling and when you decided to start talking more openly about this and, and choosing to take care of yourself? Yeah, I just realized like I, I'm not going to be able to be effective if I don't if I don't pay attention to myself for a change. Like I've been focusing so much on doing my work and taking care of my family and making sure like I'm a good husband and son and dad that I really like sort of lost track of of what I need to and you know what it looked like for me is you know like taking time to make sure that I'm like eating at at mealtime and like going and exercising regularly you know like drinking water I live in the desert just basic things that just are 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 things that just like reinforce you know if if those things are done intentionally, then that reinforces the fact that I am a person like that matters, that I ha- do work that matters, and I can reflect on that while I'm doing it that way and know that I am making a difference, even if it's not apparent right now. And then through that process, you started kind of sharing more publicly with your community, sharing things on Twitter about what you were going through. What did it kind of feel like when you learned that it seems like a lot of other people are maybe experiencing the same thing that you are. Yeah. Well, what was it like to kind of give that up to your community? To be totally honest, I'd never gotten that level of response from anything mm-hmm. I've ever written, either on Twitter or mm-hmm. or not on Twitter. And it it was maybe, you know, I did a I did a feature for Rolling Stone a couple of years ago that ended up becoming the most widely uh, read um, online article in their history. No way. About wow. Oceans and the health of the oceans and where we're headed. And maybe that got more of a response, but there is a lot of people out there. I think I counted over 500 individual people that I responded to, and I wanted to make a, a, an effort to respond to each of them personally afterwards because they came to me and said, you know, I'm I'm feeling the same way or thank you for sharing this or that you're really making it different, you know, like basically just affirming that this is not just me that feels this way. Like the combination of, of, of watching that sort of endless stream of, of news about weather and climate disasters, and then having the daily experience of trying to get the world to sort of pay attention to that and then having them not paying attention to that. And then having (laughs) some people just reject it out of hand like it it's just not a very (laughs) it's not a very easy way to make a living (laughs) but i think it's necessary so that's why i keep doing it man that's incredible and so you've got all of this stuff going on in your professional life and then it seems that your personal life is bleeding continually into your professional life And then just a few weeks ago, I saw you share on Twitter that you've been going through the process of learning that you have autism and that you were diagnosed with, you know, autism and and, and you're an adult and you've been living with this and maybe not realizing it. I would love to hear more of of that story, if you don't mind, of of that process of of maybe diving into self-care and learning more about yourself than you expected to learn. Yeah, it's just like... (laughs) <laughs> yeah, learning about yourself is a little bit scary sometimes. I feel like that's maybe why some people are hesitant to to start that process. But for me, I'm just learning about how I work and how my brain processes things just a little bit differently than most people and how that impacts the rest of my life. Um, it, it's been sort of really transformative, honestly, just understanding that the way I work and the way I see the world is totally fine. And um, if anything, it's like, (laughs) I like it, you know, like learning more about it. it, It's just like realizing that I 
have a perspective on the world that's unique in, in that people value that in that, you know, I'm lucky enough to have friends and family that are supportive and a whole community of weather nerds that are supportive. And it's just like, it's been a, a pretty interesting time, you know, this year t- trying to, to navigate, trying to navigate everything and thinking about yourself in a little bit different way. Man, you know, the first tweet that I saw that you talked about this was you shared some screenshots of the quote unquote coming out letter that you sent to your family, kind of explaining what you had learned and what that process was like. If I remember right, you were diagnosed with Asperger's and you kind of just explained, hey, here's here's what that looks like, family. What is it? The reality is I don't know all that much about Asperger's and autism. Like I know I know a good amount, but I don't I don't know a lot. And I would imagine that you maybe didn't know a whole lot either when this conversation began. Is that true? Did you, did it kind of begin a whole process of, of learning about something new? Yeah, it, it, it was really something that, you know, the more I learned about it, the more I was like, yep, that's me. You know, like it just resonates. <laughs> it's um, like a personality type test where it's like, oh, wow. Yeah, this gets me. Yep. It's the same sort of thing. And and I just wanted to share that that knowledge with people that had spent a lot of years with me and understanding me. Maybe maybe it would help our interactions make sense a little bit more. Where did you see your strengths within the world of autism? Because you know, I know especially with Aspergers, there's so many incredible strengths that that really seem play into the specific work that you do. Yeah, and I think for everyone, um, every. Every person that's autistic has their uh, special thing about them that that makes them, you know, an amazing person. So, you know, that's the whole, the saying that I've learned recently is that when you meet one person with autism, you've met one person with autism. So <laughs> it's just like that's it, it, it's it's sort of a thing that it works differently in in different people, and so it's really hard to say what it is about me that maybe is is better or more challenging because of being autistic but because it it's just it's my personality you know it yeah, it, it is me who you are. so it's really it's difficult to separate out yeah man i think it's really cool has, has it felt freeing to almost understand more of yourself in this way yeah, I mean, in it's sense that it gave me a community that I didn't know existed of people that I can relate to. And that's been super helpful. Actually, you know, we're talking about Twitter. There's a great community of autistic people on Twitter. And that has really been eye opening for me is like people advocate for themselves every day, all day, because in a world where, you know, 80 or 90 percent of people think differently than you do, you're always trying to interface with a world that feels strange and feels challenging. And to know that there are other people out there doing the same thing and sharing um, sharing their own stories, I think is really empowering. That's incredible. And I would imagine that I think there's something really cool about Twitter where you get to communicate and have conversations within your community, but then you're also reaching outside your community every single day. You know, for you, you know, you've got this whole community of of weather nerds and, and scientists and to bring a conversation about autism to the forefront. Like it's been beautiful to see the way that you've done that and the way that your community has responded. And it's been so cool to see. I mean, really, I've just been inspired by the way you've been so open with your community through this whole process. Yeah. And and again, there are a few people that just, you know, contact me and say, like, I've been going through the same thing and your, um, you know, your words really speak to me. And that's the sort of thing that, you know, if I can have that conversation or help other people have that conversation with themselves and with their um, friends and family, then I think that's a, something that's worthwhile. Man, this is so incredible. I love your story. And I love especially how open you are about everything that you've done. You know, you said, hey, here's kind of what I'm struggling with. Here we are. Here's what I'm learning right now. Here it is out on the internet. Here's, you know, what's going on with, with me and in, in learning that uh, I'm on the autism spectrum. Here it is on Twitter. You know, that whole process is is really inspiring to me. And I love that so much. As we get to the end of the show, I I want to dive in a little bit more into some of the specifics of your expertise and 
I know I've learned a lot from you from being subscribed to your newsletter, from following you on Twitter, from reading your articles and listening to your podcast. I think that right now, and we've already mentioned this a little bit, people feel maybe overwhelmed by what's going on in the world, especially in regards to science and climate. And this is something that you really intimately understand. And yes, there's cause for concern. Yes, more work needs to be done. But there's also a lot that's worth celebrating. I found that by celebrating things, it kind of gives you a sense of motivation to take more action in the world, to say, wow, there's like good that's happening. Let me be a part of it. And so I was wondering if you could share some hopeful things that are happening in the world, in the, in specifically in terms of the domain that you work in. Yeah, I feel like the, the conversation is shifting a little bit um, among people that focus on weather and climate, that we're finally starting to realize that this is a story about people. It's not really a story about science or, or graphs or charts, which is the way it's been portrayed for decades now. It's really a story of ourselves and how we interact with each other and the rest of the world. And um, I've started to, know, to see that a little bit more. And I've started to see the focus of news coverage change a little bit to focusing more on the people that are being affected already and also their hopes and dreams for the future and trying to figure out a way to make those happen in a world that is going to be a little bit scary at times, honestly. Like we we didn't really bargain to live in this sort of a world, you know, like our parents and grandparents did not have to deal with with this sort of a rapidly changing environment. And but we are going to have to. And it's going to be a lot better for everyone if we sort of are just sort of address that from the very beginning and say, this is a scary time, but we have the opportunity to um, create hope where it doesn't really feel apparent at the beginning. You know, we can say by, um, by making choices that we make every day and it can be as simple as just talking about, what you want to have happen, you know, talking about the future world that you want to live in with your friends and family and neighbors and having those conversations that we're maybe too afraid to have right now because we feel or we maybe feel that it is politicized or people might judge us or think that we're really being, you know, really a, like a downer. Like it's not necessarily that this is something that's really depressing is just that's sort of how it's been portrayed up to now like it doesn't have to be a, a depressing topic we can also choose to think of it as now we have this this chance to sort of remake the world in a way that's that everyone is excited about and and feels more in line with what we want or in line with more that's like pe people don't necessarily want to have fossil fuels they just want to have like cars that work and take them to where they need to go like or not even maybe they don't even necessarily even want cars they just want to be close to their friends and family and work in grocery stores and everything so like we don't we we can reimagine how we live and work in the world in a way that's consistent with making the world you know just as rich and diverse of a place that is as it is now Man, I love that idea. I love that mentality. I think that's really, really beautiful. What kind of advice would you give to other people who want to make a difference in the world, feel frustrated by the internal and external conflicts that are making it difficult and are maybe just looking for community and they're looking for self-care and they're looking for, for support? You know, they want to keep on going. What kind of advice would you offer someone like that? Yeah, my main advice is just to talk about it. Talk about what you need, talk about what you care about, and talk about your fears and talk about um what your vision is of your ideal perfect <laughs> world and because chances are it could happen, you know, if we work together and um chances are also that other people share those same values and concerns um more so than you might realize. So that's how you form community is just by physically talking to each other. And, you know, in, in this research for, for my book, I've been talking with psychologists and, and counselors that are focusing on, on climate and they're 
is one thing that keeps coming up is that the physical act of talking helps you process things in a different way than just by thinking about it or writing about it on social media or internalizing it. Um, it helps you to sort of physically get it out into the world and re reduces your anxiety at some, at some level. And by f having that interaction with someone else that hopefully, you know, shares your concern and eventually there will be someone that you'll find that shares your concern that, that you find some sort of like peace and direction in that. And I think that that is, it's a, it's a, it's a physical thing that happens to you. So I, I mean, I've definitely felt that, um, that myself as I've been trying to, to talk about it more in counseling that I felt myself, you know, get a better handle on what it is that I want and where it is I want to go. That's absolutely beautiful, Eric. Thank you so much for sharing your story and thank you so much for doing the work you do. I, I love learning from you and I'm so glad we got to have this conversation. Great, thank you so much for having me. Man, I absolutely loved this quote from Eric. He said, with climate, we are finally starting to realize that this is a story about people, not about science, graphs, or charts. It's really a story about ourselves and how we interact with the rest of the world. And I've started to see that a little bit more. I think that's really cool. I think it gets to the heart of why Eric does what he does. I think it's really fun to see behind the scenes in this whole world of, of science that I, I don't really understand. I barely understand podcasts and, and I have a podcast. So man, Eric's great. And I love that he dives personally into the world of self-care and how if self-care is executed intentionally and it reinforces this fact that what we do matters. If you want to keep up with Eric's work and his words and his personal story, I highly recommend checking him out on Twitter. Uh, I love his Twitter. I feel like I learn a lot and I love his overwhelming but realistic sense of optimism that he incorporates into the things that he shares. There he also shares links to articles he works on. Eric is working on an upcoming book, which you can definitely learn more about on Twitter. And he also has a newsletter and a podcast. And you can check all of that out at, at Eric Holthouse on Twitter. If you want to dive more into the world of Sounds Good and what we're up to, you can learn more and check us out at goodgoodgood.co. There you can also learn more about the good newspaper and the good newsletter where we celebrate the people, ideas, and movements that are shaping the world for the better. And on that note, that is all for this week's episode. We'll be back next week with another inspiring conversation with an incredible person. Sound good? Sound good?